So, uh, hi everyone. So, my name is Harvey Kennedy. Uh, I'm the CEO and founding director of Black Peter Health. Um, we have a really exciting sort of event planned for you tonight uh, in webinar, webinar format. Um, it will be led by uh, and hosted by Philippa Poet, who's a doctoral student uh, at University of Wolverhampton, uh, focusing on sort of, like, um, sort of looking at mental health issues for uh, uh, minority groups, such as Black and Asian and other minoritized ethnic groups, uh, just trying to understand some of the factors affecting um, these groups within those groups who identify as sort of a queer, trans, intersex, people of colour. So we'll be touching on as many points as we can tonight. We're keeping it short out of respect for those who, um, you know, like myself, uh, who have a lower capacity uh, for, uh, for sort of screens and Zoom at this time. But we understand this is quite an important um, topic to discuss. We want to make it available. So um, as a sort of CEO and founding director of Black Beta Health, you know, our goal is to really address misinformation in the communities, to try and educate individuals um, uh, from these unrepresented communities. Also to ensure that um, we signpost people to uh, the appropriate services, as opposed to um, just sort of sending people out there into the deep, uh, the wide open ocean, but really sort of be quite targeted in what we're signposting to uh, and services that we sort of stand by. And then of course, um, encouraging people to become more empowered and informed decision makers um, uh, instead of uh, sort of guessing and feeling like they don't have a, a place to go so that's that's black beta health over to you philippa hello everybody my name is philippa peart welcome to the minority stress july series i'm your host for this evening i identify as she or her i'm a mental health resource development officer i'm currently a doctoral student at the university of Wolverhampton in the faculty of health, education, and well-being. My research is about mental health in Black and Asian communities in the UK. I am passionate about these issues affecting various minoritized groups. Thank you for joining me today, and let me introduce our guests. So today we have guest J. Spy, singer, songwriter, and fashionista. Um, J. Spy, would you like to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Oh yeah, fantastic. So um, thank you for having me and it's great to be here with such amazing guests and yourself as a host. Um, for anyone that doesn't know anything about me, I am a singer-songwriter um, and I'm also a bit of a presenter as well. I was a host on a Channel 4 show called Naked Beach and that was all about helping people to learn to love themselves no matter what their shape or size. In my spare time, I'm also the showbiz correspondent for BBC Radio Manchester um, and I like champion making people feel better about themselves, be that in, in forms of their mental health, be that in terms of accepting their blackness, and be that also in terms of making sure we're doing what we can online. Um, so it's a great opportunity to be here today. We're going to be talking about stress, um, and I think it's such an important topic to cover. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And that was Jay Spy. Now we have Adelaide Harris, practicing midwife and Health Education and Resource Development Officer. Adelaide, would you like to tell us a bit about more yourself? Our, uh, there we go, I've done it now, so no one else has to worry. Um, so my name's Adelaide, I use she, her pronouns. I uh, currently live in London, um, married to Catherine, my lovely wife. Um, I'm an NHS um, midwife, um, and I work in a caseload in model of care, which is um, a social model that um, allocates sort of a named midwife and a buddy midwife to a family throughout the childbearing continuum. Um, my kind of interests lie in sort of challenging perceptions around care for marginalised groups, so uh, that primarily has been sort of LGBT groups, obviously I'm a black woman, so that informs my interest, um, and also around body weight stigma, which is perpetuated within healthcare settings, um, particularly, so that's me. Thank you, Adelaide, and now we have Louis Alexander, specialises in psychology and is an upcoming counsellor. Louis, would you like to tell us more about yourself? Yeah, so I am Lewis Alexander. I use he, him pronouns. I don't know if you can hear me because my internet's a little bit crappy at the moment. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm uh, the uh, Health Education and Resource Development Officer at Black Beetle Health. Um, my day job, I work for a private healthcare company um, assisting uh, patients with their any of their healthcare needs. Um, obviously, my background is in psychology. I did my master's degree in psychology. Part of my dissertation was uh, to look at drug addiction in the LGBT community and how 
uh, coming into cover to recovery um, has shaped their lives. Um, some of the other work that I have done, I've worked in, in a drug and alcohol reform center um, with patients, helping them re rehabilitate themselves, um, as well as helping setting up a, a gay men's and wellness and support group as well, where uh, gay men could uh, come together and, and share their experiences and uh, talk about various issues. Um, so yeah, so that's me. Um, do I need to say anything else? <laughs> Thank you, Louis. That was great. And now. Last but not least, we have Lewis Mills, Resource Development Officer. Would you like to tell us more about yourself, Lewis? Yes. So um, it's Lewis. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I am a psychological well-being practitioner, so full-time. So that basically means that I help people with anxiety, depression and panic attacks. And um, I kind of get them back on the straight and narrow, which is really nice. Um, I'm similar in a sense with uh, um, Lewis Alexander. I have a, a history with psychology as well. I did my master's in psychology last year and my thesis was around minority stress for gay black men. <gasps> so that's going to be, you know, <laughs> very convenient now. Um, but yeah, and this is my first time ever being on a panel, I think. So um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for introducing yourself. Those were our guest panel panelists for this, this evening. Today we'll be discussing minority stress in the Cutie Park communities, especially in the Cutie Park communities. Q for queer, T for transgender, I for intersex, POC is for people of colour. Minority stress is described as chronically high levels of stress faced by members of stigmatised minority groups particularly of those in the cutie pot communities. This can include certain factors in social oppression. It comes in many forms and it takes a toll on the health of individuals. Indeed, disparities in mental health and physical health outcomes have been well documented among oppressed population, including racial and ethnic minority and sexual minorities. For example, sexual minorities individuals are at high risk of mental health disorders, including depression, anxiety, substance use disorder, as well as suicide. suicide. These disparities are often linked to stressful experience of stigma and discrimination that, accom that accompany a minority so social identity. So today we'll be discussing minority stress as a factor within Cutie Park mental health and well-being to shed light on the unique personal and professional barriers faced by queer, transgender, intersex, black and or indigenous people of colour in the UK. Particularly during this difficult time, as I'm sure everybody's, you know, having stressful times, being stuck in the house, which I know it's very terrible. I'm going through the same thing. So, but normally where I come from, I'm someone from Jamaica. We don't really have issues around minority stress regarding the color of our skin, but there are huge problems in the communities of Jamaica for the cutie pot communities, such as homophobia and stigmatized attitudes. And other countries such as Western East Africa, and Southern Asia. There are also minority stress related issues for the cute pop communities. I personally never come across um, issues regarding this color of my skin till I actually came to the UK. That's when I even actually learned about racism and when I experienced it, I have to say it was a very stressful time for me as in I walked in the workplace and I could just tell that I am different by the way everybody's attitudes, the way I'm looked at, the way people speak to me, and the fact that I was always called in the office all the time. So that was very stressful and it caused me to feel a bit down as well, which had a lot of effect on my mental health. But I, I came through it, but there's still issues that need to be addressed, such as um, minority stress in the color of minorities just due to the color of my skin, but we should dig deeper into exploring this issue in the cutie pot communities. Here I have a panel of guests who have experiences in their professional and personal lives. We have Jay Spy. Jay Spy, are you there? Are you still with us? I'm with you. I'm with you, girl. 
Thank you. So I would like to ask, what do you believe the single greatest cause of mental health is in people of color? Who is this further complicated for Cutie Park? Oh gosh, that's a great question to start with. There's a lot to unpack with what you've said and, and your experience. I'm sorry that it's been the way it is. It's not nice that we do have these experiences where we're not treated in a way which is fair or equal. And um, for me, it's all about finding your power in that situation. And whenever I have felt like I've not been an equal or uh, a situation's not been fair, it's because that individual has been made to feel like they have no value. So um, a lot of things that I'm doing, especially during lockdown, to ensure that my mental health is okay and that I've got the tools to be able to handle stress is to give myself new skills. So there's a lot of free courses online. I think that the Open University website has over 160 courses you can do online. So that's a good way to upskill. Um, podcasts are a great way to keep that conversation going in a direction which benefits your, your own mental health as well um, I'm a very creative person so I found ways to to record at home and to and to get my creative juices going but if anyone is feeling like that they cannot cope um, things like this this zoom conversation you guys are experts in this field so let people reach out to you check out the black beetle website and there are ways where you can get the stress and use it as a tool to to better your life and to and to improve the environment around you and it just starts with with that conversation that you have with yourself okay brilliant did you go out like in like social events and activities to help you with such stress that you were going through um, for me personally, um, before lockdown, I did have counselling and then I was lucky enough to be on a TV show where I, in effect, became the counsellor for people that were, were dealing with other issues. And I think in terms of dealing with your own self-esteem, um, sometimes it, it, it's a result of us focusing too much on being in a, a victim mindset. And when you help other people through their own situations, that adds to your self-esteem too. So I find that doing charity work and um, being there for my family and, and lots of other things like that. I think that is a great way to, to build your resilience to be able to, to not focus entirely on, on yourself as the issue and making yourself feel like there's no way out. But everyone's situation is different, obviously. Yeah, that's brilliant because I remember when I was going through such stresses at a particular workplace, I was volunteering for Terence Higgins Trust and I felt that my skills were definitely improved and I was talking to different people, getting to know other people, and that helped with my mental health a lot because when I went home, I had other things to think about. So mm -hmm. I think that's a great example. Thank you. And we have Lewis. Lewis, are you there? Lewis Mills, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Sorry, and there's two of us, so um, we're going to have to start going on the last name basis at this point. Um, yes. So what... Tell me something, what are the main factors you think affect positive or negative mental health outcomes for Cutie Pop? For example, pop communities, Cutie Pop communities. So I think in general, um, and it was something that came from my research when I did my master's, is around social support. Social support is a very big, powerful factor that reduces um, stress and it also reduces the risk of stress becoming um, some sort of mental health challenge. So um, within the sort of cutie pop community um, specifically, it's really helpful because um, of the way information is shared. Our way of accessing sexual health or mental health services isn't plastered on adverts, it's not plastered as much on social media. So being able to have a group or be familiar with people that are like you that may share the same experiences makes information flow a lot easier and also just reduces stigma like um you know i i have friends who tmi go on um, my dating app and they're always like lewis i never see people that look like you and things like that things that we take for granted something that i just don't even think of anymore but for them um you know it's something that is is shocking it's something that's notable because it's true like you have to be really careful with um, social support. Um, so that's one positive aspect um, that I wanted to just share. Oh, that's great. That's a great um, attitude to have. I guess I can only speak on my knowledge and what I know about my own country, Jamaica, which I know mm -hmm. is a 
is very a well-known island in the world. It's had a lot of influence. And I do think that the the Qtipak communities over there, it's highly stigmatized. I think there's no social groups as people fear mm -hmm. that if they come socially together, you might have a lot of negative the negative response as in they're putting their lives at risk. And I do think that's something that needs to be addressed. I think it's slowly starting to become addressed there, but not as fast as it should be. But it is slowly getting there. But I guess it's just, you know, educating people that they need to accept people for who they are. And by the end of the day, we're all human beings. So I think we will definitely go and probably talk more about that at the next series. And now we have Adele Harris. Adele, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> Hello, so I would like to know how might poor being specializing in um, female mental health and female health in general, how might poor mental health present itself in expecting parents who does it affect the way in which people choose to access contraception and sexual and reproductive health services? Um, so I guess the, com the question is twofold. So I'll actually start with the last part of your question, if that's okay, about how um, it might affect people accessing services. So um, the kind of things that you've talked about in relation to minority stress is just um, an added layer of things to think about when you're accessing care. Um, and in terms of healthcare, whatever that might be, you're generally presenting yourself for support or help from the person that's in front of you. And so in terms of like the power paradigm, you're actually having to like take yourself and see somebody who is, has this kind of authority um, and present yourself to them. So um, what can really sort of affect people is um, their experiences. So there's been a couple of um, national surveys. There was one by Stonewall and one by the government in 2018, um, looking at um, LGBT people's experiences. And that was just generally, they didn't break down into ethnicity. And um, what they were finding is that although most people were having positive um, interactions, actually there still were a selection of people that, that were having um, sort of negative um, uh, uh, reactions when they were contacting health professionals. And that's just accessing like general health. The kind of things that they talked about was um, sort of inappropriate curiosity. Um, and also um, that people didn't have uh, the knowledge about LGBT specific um, health. So, um, and, and actually what's really interesting about that is that within sexual health, people have better responses as opposed to general health. Um, and I think that um, for those of us, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily count myself as a sexual health professional, although I work in sort of sexual reproductive health, but for the sexual health professionals amongst you, you'll probably um, be much more clued up in terms of like pronouns and um, gender identity and things like that, particularly if you identify um, as, a, as a, a queer person. Um, what the, that, that research also suggested was that um, transgender people have more contact with health professionals um, than cisgendered uh, counterparts within the LGBT community. Um, and again, um, quite a large number of those were avoiding seeking treatment because they were worried about the reaction that they were going to get. So that's just health in general before you kind of take into consideration. And so thinking about how that might impact on um, queer people in particular uh, um, and uh, black um, or uh, brown queer people. Um, so a, a good example is um, what we know is that a lot of people aren't disclosing their um, orientation um, to their health professionals and that can have quite significant implications um, further down the line. So if you're a transgender person who has a prostate and you've not disclosed to your professional that that is the case, actually you're kind of opening yourself up to potentially having complications um, for your health. So um, those are just, that's just kind of like in that little section. In relation, in relation to expectant parents, um, what we know is that um, sort of mental health does directly and strongly correlate with 
fear of childbirth, for example, um, and um, sort of fear or, or feeling unsupported um, in pregnancy, um, or, or rather feeling supported in pregnancy and um, uh, labour uh, is is kind of directly linked with having sort of a more relaxed and less painful um, experience and also a better postpartum experience, you know. Um, and a lot of this is about experience because for, for, you know, part of minority stress is actually just the worry about the experience with the professional. It's like, what if this happens? And for some people, they have directly had um, transphobic or homophobic um, experiences which is why they're carrying that and for other people it's just the, the feeling of what if this happens because I know it does happen in general life and then thinking about black people within sort of maternity care which obviously lots of people know about that the death rate for black women is five times higher than their white counterpart um, just knowing that figure and seeing that on, on the news already gives you a level of stress thinking, okay, well, how is this going to affect my experience? So those are just a couple of the things. Um, hopefully that's kind of answered your question <laughs> um, that you've asked. Yeah, that's a great answer. Being a black woman, and I've just hit 30, it does scare me to get pregnant and think about the trauma and even the death rate because I remember I think you've been two in black two influencers now that's been pregnant and they've actually died during childbirth mm -hmm. and it actually put a lot of fear in me as well to think mm, is being a mother is it for me I know I want to be a mother but do I actually want to go through that because I remember when I read something a long time ago an article I don't remember where it's from where you know, the white counterpart of people in the UK, they believe black women, when they come in a hospital, they can handle the pain because they're strong. So they leave them, instead of giving them the appropriate care that they need. I think this was based in America, where black women are more likely to be traumatized and feel more pain due to the stigma type, to the stigma and the discrimination of the skin of our color and how we are perceived across the media as very aggressive and very strong. So in their head, they think that we can handle this pain. Oh, she doesn't really need this much. Let's go to this, let's attend this other person and we are left behind. Mm -hmm. So in a way it does strike fear in me to even have a child, even though I would like to have one, but it's really like, in, I've literally shoved it in the back of my head because I'm actually traumatized mentally of what could happen mm -hmm. to me. And that's a really perfect example, actually, of minority stress that you've just given there. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. And now we have Louis Alexander. Louis, are you there? I am indeed, yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, and tell me, what changes are we likely to see with regards to substance misuse in the cutie pop communities? Okay, so I'm going to talk about like lockdown and stuff and how drug use has changed, but I think um, there has been studies to show that 30 to 60% of LGBT people deal with anxiety and depression throughout their life. And that's 1.5 to 2.5 times more, light, more higher than um, that our counterparts, basically. Um, and a third of adults um, who have a substance use uh, disorder also experience depression. But there's not a lot of figures to, to, to show uh, substance misuse in the cutie pop community um i do feel that like, that's lacking and i don't know i don't really know why um you know could it be to do with shame and fear and stigma around like drug use and alcohol use for example we're not too sure um but there's definitely a cycle when it comes to to, to drug use you know if you have anxiety you may drink or you may use um more to cope with that then you do things that you don't really want to do. You end up feeling shame. And to do with that shame and that fear and um, being disgusted with yourself, you continue to use. And then it's just a cycle of, of addiction, basically. Um, but I did read in an article that um, during the lockdown period, um, party drugs such as like cocaine or ecstasy is being used less because people weren't really going out much. But use of hardcore drugs um, such as crystal meth or GHB or even heroin and things like that, on the increase because people are now like staying indoors some of us you know are staying at home not working things like that the way they cope with it is alcohol and drugs and i know like 
there are some of my friends as well who are drinking more as well to cope with that um, uncertainty that's going on in their lives. So, yeah, um, I definitely think that, you know, we need to check on how much we're drinking, how much we're using, things like that at this time. Um, but yeah, there are various, there are also various um, places that people can visit uh, that are free if they do have drug problems or alcohol problems. So they have places like NA, which is Narcotics Anonymous, and there are various LGBT um, specific uh, Narcotics Anonymous groups that people can, can visit. Um, there's also like female specific ones, um, also black and ethnic minority groups um, that can help people facing those issues um, as well. So, so, yeah. Okay, thank you, Louise. Due to my experiences, I've had friends in the Kutu Park communities and I know I remember I have this um, Caribbean friend and he drinks a lot like drugs there's always marijuana he's always drinking and he's always oh Philip I come join me I think oh no 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 I can't I can't I have to study and I think it's due to the fact that his family doesn't give him as much support as he would like as in he had to go go out on his own by the age of 18 they was really quick to kick him out. Even though he wanted to study, they didn't care. And it really affected him, I think, mentally, because he's always talking about them. And he said, oh, Philip, my dad did this. My dad said that. It's my birthday. And they don't even care. They haven't said hello to me. I don't know what to do. But then, for some reason, when they need help around the house or they can't do it, they call him. He's the first one they call. And he has to do all the housework, all the chores. And I think it affects him really badly because even when he wants to talk about himself, they really don't want to hear it because they're fearing in their head that he's going to talk about his sexual orientation and his problem his heart is having. And I think it really like gets them agitated and they just don't want to hear it to the light. They normally shut him off. So after he's finished, he has to leave the house and he goes home and then he'll call me and call me to come over and socialize which I do because I like socializing he's a fun guy but um I can see where the discrimination comes in black families especially with their cultures as they believe uh, like, mm -hmm. you if you yeah. are if you are gay you have the devil inside of you you need to be changed and I think they do his stepmom is Christian and I think they did try to change him at one point and he was laughing at the time. So Philip, I'd just been to church and the pastor was praying over me and yeah. this was happening and all that. And I actually laughed as well because I'm thinking they really think this is actually going to work. That's how they think. But in a way, I think that these are Christians that they should know to accept people for who they are, but they don't know how to do that. Come on, trigger warning. <laughs> trigger <Yeah. laughs> <Trigger> warning. <laughs> Throwing that out there for them. <laughs> And they're going to church and they're talking about God and love, but they don't know how to show love to even their own blood relatives. So to me, I think there's a big hypocrisy there. And I think, in a way, I think they're ignorant. And sometimes I think they know they're wrong, but it's because of old traditions and the way they've been brought up. They'll feel like they need to keep pushing it just to see, just to show that, you know, they're adults and they know what's right and what's wrong and they literally just push their wrong morals on, onto you and in a way they're even suffering themselves they don't even know how to handle their own relationships or own social gatherings but they concentrate on you because obviously it's ignorance is bliss am i correct oh, so right. yeah so if you, what were you going to say were you going to say something jace five no, I completely agree with what you said. Um, it's a shame about your friend as well. It ties in what, with what I was saying before about um, finding the value in yourself because if his family are quick to call him round to do things like the housework, but then when it comes to things for him, they don't want to know or they don't want to engage in that part of his life, it probably gets to a point where he'll have to make a decision whether or not he wants to continue to allow the relationship to be as it is because when you find the value in yourself, you'll start to find the value in your time and realise that actually you don't need to be around people that make you feel a certain way, even if they are your family. Um, no one deserves to be made to feel that way. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of escapism going on at the moment with the drugs and the drink um, and not, in fact, using them for what they're intended to be like when he's drinking. It should be a celebration and not to escape the, the mindset of what he's got to deal with. It sounds like you're a fantastic friend and an ally for him and you're in a very difficult position, but um, 
if you can find a way to get him to do things for him and maybe get him to a place where he's comfortable enough to to either speak to his family on a level or make the decision not to spend as much time around his family so that it doesn't affect him in that way, that'd be really, really good. Um, but it is a shame that, that people who are religious um, sometimes do push these ideologies that are actually in, in line with religion because religion is about love and acceptance of all people. And a lot of the time when people are pushing narratives um, whereby it's oppressing someone who's different to them, it's because A, they've grown up in a way that they don't want to leave that mentality behind or also they've got problems in their own life and they're fearful or they're unhappy because if you are happy and you are accepting of yourself then you've got no qualms with anybody else let's be real happy people don't attack other people or try to change other people um, and I think one one of the great things about the lockdown has been that we've been forced to to look at our own behavior and the people we interact with and question what works and what doesn't because everything's being magnified now we're engaging with social media a lot more and people are starting to call out attitudes and behaviors that don't work that haven't worked for a long time and we're seeing a lot of big change and um, but on a fundamental individual level we can also look at how we are contributing to, to the lives that we lead and, and hopefully things like this Zoom conversation will, will spark something in anyone that's listening to start making better, well-informed decisions about their life. Oh, that's, that's a great answer. I do agree with everything you have said. As, as me with the friend and his mom and his dad, I don't really engage in a lot of conversations with them because I have a time where I can get a little bit too mouthy. So I'd rather just keep the peace. <laughs> with them as long as you know if he's around there i know i can um go and visit him instead of them saying no no philip i cannot come on here she's too feisty or whatever you know so i try to keep the peace but i i am i do try my best to be there as much as i can for him in case if he wants to come around and chill and just be himself even though my mother is a jamaican she's a real jamaican and coming over here she's actually learned and she's knowledgeable around the cutie pop communities and she doesn't really it doesn't bother her she doesn't care she thinks it's, you know it's she's fine with my friend she accepts him for who he, she, who he is she doesn't ask any question to just treat him normally so i think with my mother i think that um if my mother can do it i think a lot of families can do it as well you know the fact that she comes from a very a country that's you know homophobic and she's come over here and she's completely changed. Her mindset is changed. She doesn't ask, she doesn't discriminate, she doesn't treat anybody differently. So I think there's a lot that can be done with the mothers of the black and Asian communities and fathers. There's a lot that can be done, but I think there's a, that's another time for another conversation and how we can actually do that. So, okay, so thank you everybody that has joined me today. I noticed that we've had some comments. This is from someone about, this is from Charlotte who says, both Beyonce and Serena Williams had complications and complaints about treatment during labor and pregnancy. So even with that much fame and fortune, still cannot be confident. I didn't know that, but that is, that is very good to um, actually acknowledge that. I didn't know that Beyonce and Serena had problems with um, racism in the health sector. That's something I probably need to go and read upon myself. <laughs> okay, and that is a great session. Thank you. I'm just wondering, you know, I, I sort of want to respond to um, some of the feedback that we had, you know, people wondering, why not just talk about minor, minority stress? Why, why, have you, why have you guys got to always make it cutie pock? And I thought to myself, um, that's a really important question, but I, I also see that as quite an important opportunity to highlight, uh, you know, the importance of, of, of dealing sort of with, with cutie pot issues separately. Uh, and that's because a lot of times we see services for, for, for minorities of people of colour, we see services for LGBT people, but very rarely do we see services that are geared for that overlap and that intersection of those two things. And there is an assumption that because you're a person of colour and you might identify as queer, that you are automatically accepted by your community. And actually we know that, that quite the opposite is true. Uh, and, and of course people also assume that, well, you know, you're not part of our, uh, uh, you know, our community in as far as being a, a person of colour, but you know, you want to do the LGBT thing, go over there and be with those LGBT people over there. And, and the assumption then again is that we can just 
you know, walks into sort of LGBT spaces and it's just one big festival when really we know that that is another sort of kettle of fish that opens up itself uh, and becomes another issue for, for, for queer trans and people of colour. And then where does that leave people? It leaves people quite abandoned. It feels, uh, it leaves people quite, you know, um, th th their needs are not considered, certainly not being part of the research. We know that in order for, for sort of policy and things to be put in place to protect our communities and to and ensure we have um, sort of provision, uh, you know, we ha it has to be in the evidence. You know, everything's all about evidence-based practice and a lot of times you know we don't even get a chance to be part of the evidence and so one of my big things is saying make sure to become a part of the evidence base don't let research and surveys pass you by and you say like oh i haven't got time to feel that mean we have to become a part of the evidence base because otherwise we're allowing other people to make decisions about what we do without actually asking or consulting with us and therefore that leads to to, to poorer health outcomes and health inequalities and all the things that we fight against at black Peter health really so you know that's something i wanted to sort of respond to um for whoever might watch sort of be here now or watch this um sort of um uh, after the fact, is that cutie pot minority stress is its own thing. And, and I, I saw someone mention intersectionality just now. You know, I almost hate to um, uh, sort of uh, highlight that word because some people have different feelings about the word intersectionality. But intersectionality is the word that I'm going to select because I think that a lot of people know what that is. Um, and that can come in any form. I think all of us on this call, both those are, are, are visible and those that are not visible, uh, will have our own experience of intersectionality and what that means to us because of the, of the different factors that we bring together, whether you female presenting or male presenting, or you might be from an Afro-Caribbean background or an African, you know, background or you know these are all different things and that's that is for another event for another day really the difference between uh, all the different subgroups within the definition of black and all the different subgroups within the definition of asian because it just um you know i think it's very poorly understood and we have to uh, put ourselves in positions to talk about it so uh, yeah i just wanted to highlight that thank you very thank you harvey that is harvey kennedy he's the ceo and director of black beta health and is there any other questions with anyone would like to ask ask any questions Adelaide do you have anything to add I've always got something to add for the first. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that how important it is as black professionals or the people that are kind of sat here on this panel about how we do take ourselves into our work and I think one of the things um, that was really clear for me when I started to think about my identity and how that influences my work was that I was trained to fit into the system and the system is Eurocentric and it's um, heteronormative and cisnormative and actually just um, you know when we have those opportunities just gently challenging just letting people know you know that we work alongside that not everybody has the same perspective as you not everybody experiences things in the same way as you and um, I know that for those of you that have done further study you know masters and doctorates and stuff like that 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 is what you're doing and I completely you know I really applaud you because because we're so evidence but you know everything is evidence-based we can't pretend that evidence is objective because it is always informed by the person that has you know carried out the research but actually if we're we're having voices you know we're at the table conducting research you know reviewing what's out there we can identify the gaps and do something more about it and i think particularly in my sector it's taken quite a long time for anything to kind of happen we've had these statistics about um you know black women dying in higher numbers and that the, the report comes out every and the report comes out and they're still there the numbers are still there but they you know it's only just recently that the RCOGs the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have actually set um set up a working group to look into the reasons why because at the moment we can only say that this is happening mm -hmm. and based on our other information we can guess that a lot of that is based um you know, it's potentially influenced by um, unconscious bias and institutional racism and the systems that are set up. But there is nothing backing that up. So we can only guess based on the other information that those are the reasons. Um, and so we just need to do more. So I just encourage anybody that has an interest, wherever you are, whatever sector you're working in, do just do something get out there you know make yourself known if you want to do further study when you're thinking about what you're going to write your thesis on do it some, do it about something that's personal um you know that's connected to you connected to your community because because it really does help other people okay thank you 
and I'm wondering also, you know, I think we talk a lot about what the issue is, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if some of our sort of um, counsellor people or uh, psychological wellbeing people, Lewis, Lewis, if, that, if you can provide us with like some solutions, you know, I think a lot of times we can talk about what we know, but what do we do about this during, particularly during this time, I'm wondering. Should I go first? Sorry, could you repeat that? I, can you repeat that, Harvey? Sorry. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you have any solutions for what we can be doing during this time to handle minority stress and just stress and high levels of cortisol, which uh, you know have negative effects on the body, which is another conversation. But I'm, I'm wondering about solutions. What solutions are there for this? Yeah, I think I think I can only share by personal experience. And I think for me, when I'm stressed, I, I always try and do things that I enjoy. I always try my best to exercise, um, take a moment, myself ring my friends um try and get sometimes we can be our own worst enemy and we can go we can just i call it washing machine head things go around and around in our heads and sometimes when we vocalize that to other people get a different perspective on it um it, it helps and it definitely helps me um as well but yeah i definitely encourage people as well to just have therapy as well if you need it because i don't know i had therapy myself when i was younger and it definitely changed my, my life so um, I wasn't able to, I don't feel comfortable to talk with my family about some of the stresses that I was going through, but when I spoke to someone outside of that, you know, it was quite liberating. So, so yeah. Um, Louis, Alexander, tell me, do you think because everyone's different, you have black and Asian, you have different types of Asians, you have South, you have Pakistani, Afghan Afghanistan, Indian, Hindu, Bangladeshi, then you have the black side or you have black African, then you have black Caribbean. Do you think there's a development in cultural counseling, as in to try and meet people's different needs? Because we all have different needs and we all have different cultures. Do you know ways in how to meet and understand their point of view from where they come from as their background? Is there any development in that happening at the moment or you don't know? Is that a Lewis A question or no, that's Lewis, Lewis Mills question? Lewis Alexander. Um, yeah. Do you know what? I mean, I did see something on, what was it, the news about having, having um, counsellors of colour assisting those in minorities. And especially there's a lack of black men in the profession and that needs to, to, and this is why I'm here, you know, <laughs> um, there definitely needs to be a bit more people of colour being, assisting those in minorities, because, you know, when you go to, to a, uh, I'm not going to say, when you go to a counsellor and you want to talk about cultural issues and, and things like that, you know, you want to be understood, you want to be heard, you don't want uh, a counsellor or therapist to be telling you, you know, um, it's all in your head or whatever. Um, but I think we've got a long way to go in in terms of uh, understanding different cultural perspectives on things and and how we see the world because you know yeah um but i don't, I don't have any solutions in, in how we make that better okay. i just guess we need my, more diversity in the mental health um professions okay thank you and unfortunately this is the time where we're going to end things thank you everybody for participating and who decided to join us today we really appreciate it. I hope that we've taken in what has been said today and to go back and reflect and how we can help the QTPAC community, people of color and people of the of queer communities to help and come together to make things better for each and every one of us to improve our psychological health and well-being. Thank you everybody for joining us um is there anything else would anybody like to say anything quickly just a quickly 30 seconds anything no okay then thank you everyone for joining us and hopefully we will have another session where we'll talk about different issues in the cutie pop communities and even issues in just people of color next time and hopefully that will be soon and we'll keep you updated thank you